Okay, well, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. All right, that's where we're going to be at primarily. We will, though, go over and look at Joel, which we actually looked at Joel a few sessions ago, but we got to go back. Uh, so this is our session number 15 of the last days. So we've been doing this for a good little while, and honestly, we've still got a ways to go. Uh, the topic or the title of this session is going to be This Is That. This is that. And that's actually coming from Acts chapter 2, verse 16. If we, hey, come on in, come on in. We've got notes for you up front if you'd like some. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to see what is going on in that transition from the Gospels to the book of Acts, okay? And it absolutely is relevant for the last days, the end times, the tribulation, the sun turning to darkness, the moon to blood, the water turning to blood, stars falling from heaven, all the crazy apocalyptic events that you read about and you picture in the Bible. This is relevant because what we're trying to determine is, what is this kingdom thing about? What is this tribulation thing about? Is it staying consistent with Old Testament prophecy? Or is something getting shifted? Do you need to be worried about it, right? On top of all the other things you have going on right now and the election coming up on Tuesday... Do you also need to be worried about facing a tribulation? I think those are the things you want to know. And we don't get those answers, truthfully, from just the book of Revelation. I would even say that most of our answers about the last days is we, we actually find it in other parts of the Bible. Revelations is just the details, all right? It's giving you the details. But everything else is actually set up for us. So when we got to the close of Matthew chapter 28... We observed that the, uh, they're throwing t-shirts around there, uh, but we observed that Jesus' instruction to the disciples was not, go tell the world, say by grace through faith, not of works. No, it was, you are to teach this gospel, proclaim this gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's, it's the Jewish message that the kingdom is at hand. You need to repent. And so what we're finding is as we're getting into even the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, the concept, the focus is still, this is Jewish matter, it's kingdom matter, it's tribulation matter, okay? And I think we're going to see that even as we get into session number 15 here. So uh, let me open us up in word of prayer, and then we'll get uh, right into it. Lord, thank you for this time that we have to study your word. And I pray that as we uh, analyze what it has to say, that we would rightly divide it, carefully paying attention to uh, what it says. And hopefully it will give us some good peace of mind. I, I do believe that we have some very uh, comforting words uh, that is in our gospel that we can take great comfort and peace in. And with that, I pray that we'd understand your word uh, better today. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. So if we are going to understand the last days matter, okay? And I think this is relevant because I look at y'all and y'all all have kids in the house and they have questions. And so how do you go about answering it? How do you help them understand well, the key is understanding this transition, I think. We've got to get this transition from the Gospels to the book of Acts right, okay? It's crucial. And I think standard Christian teaching is the Gospels are getting us ready for the church age, uh, the age that we live in. And then the second that you get to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, we're off to the races, right? This is the church as we know it today. It's all about us, all the instructions about us. And guess what? You absolutely do have references to tribulation, trials, enduring till the end, even in the book of Acts and onward into the other epistles of Peter, James, and John. Well, if we're going to apply that, well, if, if we're going to be deriving our position on what the kingdom and the tribulation is, if we don't have any clear position to argue that we're operating outside of that program, that we're something different, we would have to say, well... The tribulation's about us. The kingdom's about us. We better get ready for it, right? Our kids may very well live to see the Antichrist. We may live to see the Antichrist. But I think if we analyze the Bible, we can uh, understand exactly what is going on here, and we'll get this right. So it, it's been our position up till Acts chapter 2, that's where we're going to be today, is that the kingdom of God, it's consistent. This is a future physical thing, all right? And that's a hard pill to swallow, and I've talked about that before, because so many churches, like their whole identity is we are kingdom builders. As a matter of fact, I think that's even an exact catchphrase, maybe a trademark phrase that 
a church or a ministry has, right? We're building the kingdom. Every Sunday we meet, we're building the kingdom. And that's because they take that spiritual kingdom view. When you get up and say, hold on, wait a minute, all right? I know it's a catchy phrase. I know we like it. Just like how the Inflation Reduction Act didn't reduce inflation. Uh, our, uh, our, our view on the kingdom here, I think it's a little bit skewed, okay? What does the Bible say? I know what our t-shirts say. I know what our, our songs, worship services say. But what does the Bible say? And I think consistently from the Old Testament all the way up to this point here, the kingdom is about the nation of Israel. We can't build it, all right? No matter how much work we do, it's not going to make uh, Christ come and reign on the throne. It's not going to bring in everlasting righteousness. It's not going to write the law of God, of God in the hearts of the people. We just, we cannot do that. It's a different thing. It's not our program. And I think that the, tri the, the tribulation is also consistently in the context of Israel. So when we get to Acts chapter 2, and we're about to read some of this passage here in just a moment, we basically have a couple options that we've got to keep in mind, okay? So... Here's our Acts chapter 2 possibilities. Either prophecy is expanded, okay? That's one possibility. Maybe there is some expansion here. Maybe the kingdom is broadened a little bit. Maybe the tribulations broadened. Maybe Israel to a degree is broadened. Somehow that scope is shifted, okay, to where um, maybe the kingdom is not just future physical, but maybe somehow it's here and now, or maybe God's chosen people. It's not just Israel, but expanded beyond somehow. Um, God has already promised He will fulfill the kingdom promises, that it will come. So we can't redefine the kingdom. We just can't do it. All right, That would be a complete redefinition of the Old Testament, because the Old Testament says the Messiah will come, He will reign as King in Jerusalem. So that's one, one possibility. Another possibility is Acts chapter 2 is completely outside of the prophetic program. That we're, we're dealing with something that the prophets didn't speak of, so therefore it's something completely on its own. It's a different thing, and so we don't need to make the Old Testament prophecy apply. Okay, That could be a case. The other a possibility is it's just the continuation of prophecy, that it's the fulfillment of it, that it affirms it. So... We're going to look and see in the chapter of Acts 2, is there uh, any information, any explanation as to what is going on? Does it fulfill prophecy? How does it fit into this whole picture? So that's what we're going to be looking at here, okay? So if we go to Acts chapter 2, verses 12 through 15, that's what we're going to read. I'll remind you the Holy Ghost has just come upon Peter and the disciples, and they're speaking in different tongues, Okay. It's not the tongues of blabbering, okay? It's tongues in other languages. There were Jewish men there for Pentecost. It was a Jewish feast. They were Chaldean, Greek, whatever, and they were hearing it in their own language, right? This would be like me opening my mouth and speaking in some language, you know, like French, okay, or something else. I have... I can say wee oui, wee, oui, and that's about it. Croissant, is that, a, is that a French word? I have no idea. If not, it's very deceptive because croissant sounds French. But with that being said, that's the scene there as they are speaking. Verse 12, and they were all amazed. So the Jewish men present, they were amazed, hearing the disciples speaking in their own tongue. Remember, they said, aren't these men Galileans? Okay, they could tell something about them. Either they knew they were from Galilee or by their accent. I have no idea. But they were saying one to another, what meaneth this? Verse 13, others mocking said these men are full of new wine. Now, I have long thought that verse 13 is others mocking the disciples, saying that they are full of new wine. Like, oh man, you know, don't, don't listen to those guys. That's not the Holy Ghost. They're just all drunk, blabbering like crazy. But I think what, I, what I, I, I would say instead is, why would they say that the disciples were full of new wine if they were speaking in other tongues? Okay, I, I don't think if you, you know, make a guy drunk enough that he's going to start speaking in a coherent language. He'll probably speak in something that sounds like another language, but it probably won't be very coherent. And so, I don't know, maybe we should experiment. If uh, we drink enough, maybe we can speak in another language. I think verse 13 is actually, though, saying, oh, you only think they're speaking in another language. Y'all are already so drunk that you're just hearing things. I think that's probably the position there. And so, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. 
So let's pause right there and think, once again, what is our context? Peter gets up and he speaks to the men of Judea, all right? Now, the men of Judea. Judea is a very specific region, okay? Um, Galilee is the northern part of Israel. Judea is the southern part of Israel. That's where we get the term like the southern kingdom of Judah, Judea. So, ye men of Judea, those of you that live here, those of you that actually are, are um, born, bred Judeans, okay? Uh, then there's this other group. There's those that are of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. So all you that are here at Jerusalem right now, hearken unto my words. Be this known unto you. Verse 15, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Every time I read that, I have to just stop and laugh because it's almost like he's saying, maybe a little bit later on, we'll break out the booze, okay? But for right now, we're not drunk. It's just the third hour of the day. <laughs> Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. But this is that. That is going to be the focus of this whole thing. What does Peter mean by this is that and what is that prophecy of the prophet Joel? Now, before we go any further, I would say, I think our answer to our first question is, is made clear. We said there's only a few possibilities in Acts chapter 2, right? Either we're expanding prophecy or we are somehow operating outside of prophecy, okay, in a completely different thing, not related to Israel, or this is just an affirmation or continuation of prophecy. I think verse 16 makes it clear. When you read Acts chapter 2, this is about an Old Testament prophecy. It's the fulfillment of it. It's the affirmation of it. So there's our answer right there. It's a continuation of prophecy. Now let me pause, and I want you to listen to me, okay? If you say that Acts chapter 2 is about Israel and not the church, not us, not the body of Christ, the vast majority of pastors and churches are going to strongly disagree with you, okay? They're going to say that Acts chapter 2 is about us. It's about our foundation of the church. It's where this whole thing started. There's some people that would call themselves Acts 2 dispensationalists, meaning that they believe our dispensation, the age of grace, started in Acts chapter 2, okay? So, I also want you to be prepared. If you go to pick up a Bible, or, well, um, a study Bible, let me say that. A study Bible that has notes in it, marginal notes, and you read about Acts chapter 2, they will tell you something like, this is the beginning of the church. This is the fulfillment of it, okay? This is when our age of grace starts. Peter was preaching our gospel, things like that. Or if you were to just t turn on uh, the radio and listen to a preacher, and they're talking about Acts chapter 2, they're going to be talking about Acts chapter 2 as if this is our church, okay? This is our foundation. This is our beginning. And that's true if you go to most churches around here. If you were to visit a church somewhere else on a Sunday, like just pick any church down the road probably, they're going to say, this is all about us, okay? I am telling you, according to Peter's testimony, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, all right? This is not you and I. This is not mystery stuff. Remember, we looked at our options we said it could be outside the prophetic program, but it's not. It's a part of that prophecy. It's the fulfillment of it. Therefore, the focus here is the nation of Israel. Now, somebody could argue and say, well, but this is expanding the prophecy. Now it's incorporating us. Now it's going to become about us. I will argue that in Acts chapter 2, as we read further, you are not going to see at one point our gospel or the body of Christ being referenced or incorporated in any way, okay? So even though Acts chapter 2, it's commonly taught that way, most people, I think, misunderstand it. So this is that. Peter explained why he and the disciples were speaking in different tongues. He was giving an explanation. Let me tell you why you're hearing me speak in your own tongue, okay? 
And it was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. In fact, Peter was quoting, he actually did quote, verse for verse, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Joel. If you go, if you find Amos, go to the left. If you find Hosea, go to the right. And so Joel chapter 2 Verse 28, this is Peter speaking to this matter. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And so here's what Joel says. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So... In the last days, it'll come to pass afterward. These things are going to occur. The, uh, the wonders in heavens and earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That is the description that Joel gives. If we go to Acts chapter 2 and read verses, 16, or verses 17 and onward, look at what Peter says. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And it just goes on, and he recites the testimony of Joel chapter 2. So this is that. That's Peter's testimony there regarding the prophecy of Joel. Now, you will recall in session 9, okay? Session 9, I know that was a while back, like a month ago or so. Session 9, we actually basically did kind of an aerial view of Joel. We kind of did a flyover. We didn't read every verse, but we did look at every chapter. There's only, you know, three of them, so it's not like it's an impossible task. But we looked at all three chapters, and we wanted to get the main point of Joel. And Joel centers around the day of the Lord, okay? That's what he's focused on. That's what it's all about. And what I want people to understand is, if we read Joel, the day of the Lord is about a very particular group of people. That would be the nation of Israel, all right? So in light of today being November 3rd and a major event occurring on November 5th, let me say to you, okay, whoever is going to be in the White House come January of next year, they are not going to be the Antichrist, okay? Uh, Just, I would be willing to take that to the bank. Because I know many Christians, because we don't understand that this is a continuation of prophecy, and this is that, and it's about Israel, and it's not about us, the day of the Lord is not imminent upon you and I. At least the day of the Lord, that is the tribulation and the nation of Israel. Now, the rapture could come at any point, And when the rapture comes, then the day of the Lord is going to proceed after that. But have a little bit of peace of mind that even though things could get bad, and it absolutely could, it's not biblical prophecy unfolding, okay? Um, whoever is the president next year is not going to uh, be the fulfillment of that prophecy. For one, I think that the Antichrist, for example, and we'll, we'll get into this at a later point, I think the Antichrist is actually going to be Jewish in nature. And from what I can tell, neither of our two candidates are Jewish in, in any background at all. Um, we did have the potential for a vice president candidate to be Jewish, but then he didn't get chosen So with that being said, very confident we're not seeing prophecy fulfilled. So take a deep breath, okay, everybody? We need to lighten up. All right, it's going to be okay. Um, With that, you could absolutely make some bad choices when you go to the voting booth, so be careful. Now, with that being said, um, this is a continuation of prophecy. Joel testifies that the day of the Lord is about Israel and the fulfillment of those last days. And there is going to be a great time of trouble for Israel, There's going to be then the deliverance of Israel. God is going to come and carry out judgment upon those nations that mistreated Israel. Now, 
The Israel here, I would also argue, is still not the Israel that we have yet today. This is not the prophetic program. We don't live in that time. That is a nation that is called Israel, and there's a lot of Jewish people in it, but it's not the Israel that is of these prophecies here. Now, um, it'll be a remnant of the Jewish people in those days. So in, in Joel's third and final chapter, after God pours out His Spirit, if we go back to Joel chapter 2, uh, and it says, after those things, the pouring out of the Spirit, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, the wonders of heaven, the sun turned to darkness, the moon into blood, and then it coming to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. Zion is Jerusalem, okay? Verse 3, sorry, chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days, in that time, shall I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. This is all about the nation of Israel. I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And this is going to be Armageddon, okay? The, 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 the valley of Megiddo, the valley of Jehoshaphat. I believe, I'm confident, this is Armageddon that you're seeing right here, okay? So Armageddon, my position I think I'm very confident in this, is not going to be fought between the United States and China, the United States and Russia. That's not Armageddon, okay? Um, World War III, yes. Armageddon, no. All right? Or Armageddon is going to be between the armies of the Antichrist marching on to destroy the nation of Israel, God coming and bringing judgment upon them, okay? That's the picture that we're seeing. And so that's what Joel's focus is. That is the preparation uh, of all these events leading up to the final days of God bringing in everlasting righteousness, dwelling in Jerusalem, Christ coming, His second coming, reigning as King. And Peter, when he invokes Joel here in, Joel, in Acts chapter 2, I should say, he is preparing the Israelites, telling them that the day of the Lord is upon them. Here it is. It's at hand. It's about to come. This is that. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. The last days are about to be completed. The prophecy is about to be fulfilled. All these things. However, even though Peter clearly says this is that, and he quotes Scripture, and we have Joel right here saying this is what's going to happen. It will come to pass afterward. I will pour out my spirit. This is all last day stuff. Uh, and then the sun being turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. That's tribulation. That's judgment. That's God's wrath. Yet, despite all that, many pastors and theologians will say, they will tell you, this is not that. Now, I know Peter said, this is that. But what I'm telling you is, this is not that. I'm speaking as if I'm a pastor here. It's my view that Peter said, this is that, so that was that. But many will say that this cannot be that. All right? And for many theologians, it's problematic that Peter said, this is that. Because when Peter said, this is that, guess what that means? That's, that's the last days. That's end times prophecy right there. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of. And so if Peter is outright declaring, this is that, this is Joel's prophecy, the day of the Lord is at hand, this would include the second coming of Christ, Jesus coming, setting up the throne, judging the nations. However, when you read Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and all the way through to the end of Acts 28, Jesus doesn't come. Judgment doesn't come. Everlasting righteousness doesn't come. The kingdom is not established. What do you do? Peter said, this is that. Here's the solution that they have to say. Many will come up with the solution that Acts chapter 2 was not the actual fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. That Peter got up and said, this is that to say, hey, hold on, hold on, everybody. I know you think they're all drunk. But what I'm telling you is, remember how Joel said that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh? Well, this is kind of like that. So in their view, maybe Peter should have said, this is kind of like that, instead of this is that. And they will argue that this is just foreshadowing the last days. That Acts chapter 2 is just, it's a, it's a near fulfillment. A near fulfillment is basically saying, well... 
yeah, it, it did fulfill the prophecy, but it's not the real fulfillment of it. The true last days are going to come later, all right? Later towards the end, those things are going to be fulfilled. And they will actually say that Peter was maybe a little bit confused. Peter thought it was the last days, but Peter was just a little mistaken. He was a little bit excited. He jumped the gun. He, he didn't quite know the full story. As a matter of fact, here is a quote from David uh, Guzik. Uh, he is not super well known in just common, like, did anybody here today come here and see that and think, oh, wow, yeah, David Guzik, I read all his stuff. He's not just super well known, but he, he is well known in the commentary world. So if you go to different websites that have Bible commentaries, he has a lot of them, okay? Uh, have y'all read Bible commentaries before? Have y'all really seen them? I reference them a lot. What I mean, like a Bible commentary, let's say you buy a Bible commentary on the book of Acts. The, the Bible commentary is essentially the book of Acts, like the whole thing, but every verse has paragraphs of comments, okay? Like, this is what that means. This is what that's talking about. See this cross-reference over here. See this cross-reference over there. And so uh, it really is a breakdown of it. He writes a lot of commentaries, and, and I'm not picking on him in particular. So, David, you ever see this? I'm not mad at you personally. You just serve as a good example of reflecting the common views amongst most preachers. But let's see what he has to say about this is that. This quotation from Joel 2, 28 through 32, focuses on God's promise to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. What happened on the day of Pentecost, know what he says, was a near fulfillment of that promise. So, let's just think about this clearly. Let's get this in concrete. The... A common view, a broadly accepted view by very well-esteemed preachers, teachers, pastors, seminary professors, theologians, you name it, is that when Peter said, this is that, it's not really that. It was like that, and it was maybe kind of a foreshadowing of that, but that is not that. Okay? That's the view. And so he says, with the final fulfillment coming in the last days. If you read Acts chapter 2, let's just look at it one more time. Verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days. It, he says, this is that, it will come to pass in the last days. Sounds like Peter's saying this is the last days. Furthermore, let's go to 1 John. Turn your Bibles first on. This is not in your notes, but I want to talk about it for a moment because I think it's important. First John, it'll help prove my case. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 and it is verse... 18, John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. Now, the, the Greek there, eschatos oris, last hour, last days, that's what he's saying. It is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many anti Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So we have 1 John saying it is the last time. The last days, eschatos ora. Peter, second, or, or Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. This is that. I think that the disciples, the apostles, were convinced that they were living in the last days. I think you see it testified by Peter, and you see it testified by John uh, in, the, in, the, in the writing of Hebrews. Uh, let me just see. Let's do a little bit of Bible, of, of, of Bible flipping here to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Let's go read verse 1 because you kind of need it to understand verse 2. 
God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Made the worlds. Last days. Last days. I think that John is convinced it's the last days. I think Peter's convinced that it's the last days. And I think the writer of Hebrews, probably Paul, that's my position, was living in the last days. And even though we have all that testimony, Pentecost was only the near fulfillment of it. When the last days truly come, then it will be fulfilled. Churches have tried, pastors have tried to make sense of this. How does the Bible say we're in the last days? And it's no wonder you read the Bible, it says it's the last times. And if you don't have anybody explain this stuff to you, guess what? Well, it says we're in the last days. This election could be it. Whatever does happen, yeah, the Antichrist could come. We could be in tribulation. I've got to be stocking up food. You should do that anyways. That's just probably a good idea. Uh, plenty of food, plenty of water, things like that. Um, but people are very much on edge. Is the last days coming? Is Armageddon coming? Civil war? I mean, just there's a lot of bad things that could happen. But is it biblical? Is it what Scripture is prophesying of? Well, you have the testimony, not here, but in other places of the actual Bible, that it's the last days. We live in the last times. How do we make sense of that? How could 2,000 years ago be the last days, and yet that last days has continued all the way up till now? What sense does that make? You have a couple different answers. One answer says that the last days has just been extending all this time. My question is, why does it seem like everything was ramping up a lot back then and now not so much here? Why is it that you had signs and wonders then? I mean, remember when they crucified Christ? Sky went dark, right? Uh, there was the signs. There was the manifestations. There were the tongues. There was the prophecy. There was the, I think, the satanic forces at work as well, the demon possession. Why was it then? And here we are now. And I would say at the very least, we can all agree not near as of biblical proportions, right? If uh, somebody has a demon, it's, you know, a little bit debatable. The demon possession pictured in the Bible, remember the, the, the demoniac in, uh, in Gadarene? He was breaking chains. They were chaining him and he could break them, right? Now, if we see a video and somebody's eyes roll in the back of their head, we're like, demon, 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 demon. I know y'all have seen videos like that in recent days. Oh my goodness, look at this politician. Somebody in the background, their eyes rolled the back of their head. It's of Satan. It's of the devil. Oh my goodness. All right. Why is it that scripture seems so clear? That was the last days. Peter says this is all playing out. And yet here we are today, 2,000 years later. Either somehow the last days has been going on all this time or something else right? Now, his answer is, that wasn't really the last days. I think you're flying in the face of what Peter, James, and John, Peter, John, and the writer of Hebrews told us. I think instead of going with what Guzik said, and what Guzik said is just what a lot of other people have said, you know, he's, he's just repeating what he's been told. You know, theologians are kind of like children. You ever hear them repeat what they say? Have you ever said something you shouldn't say, and then they've repeated you? Preachers do that as well. Um, it's not as bad as you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but theologians are kind of like toddlers. They will pick up whatever they hear, right? So he's probably just repeated it at some point along the way. And, and, and notice what he adds here at the very end. So Pentecost was a near fulfillment of that promise, but Joel chapter 2 was actually about the final fulfillment coming in the last days. And notice the little parentheses which Peter had good reason to believe he was in. That's us patting Peter on the head and saying, Oh, Peter, you thought you were living in the last days. That You are so adorable. Whenever my son does something that's cute, I'm like, Oh, I'm so proud of you. Like, Oh, Peter, you thought you were living in the last days. I feel like we treat the, the apostles with like such like disdain sometimes. Like we almost look down on them. Like they, they didn't understand. They were confused, but we know. The seminary professors, the pastors of these mega churches. We know the truth. Peter was just confused. Poor Peter. I would say, uh, no, I think Peter knew what he was talking about. Remember how I... <laughs> They're almost saying Jesus was a bad teacher, okay? I'm getting fired up. I'm getting mad now. 
Um, and when preachers get mad, they don't typically cuss in sermons. They just go to more passages of Scripture. So let's just look in Acts chapter 1 one more time. I'll remind you in our last session, here's what we read. Okay. Verse 2, Jesus is resurrected in Acts chapter 1 verse 2. All right. Um, until the day which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. For 40 days, 40 days, Jesus taught them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then we're going to say in the immediate next chapter, just, just right after Jesus' ascension, Peter instantly gets it wrong. He thought he was in the last days and he wasn't. I think we have such disrespect for the apostles and it's a real shame. We should just take them for what they say, okay? So when you're reading your Bibles, if Peter says this is that, let's just go with this is that and leave it at that, all right? And that's all I've got to say about that. Not really, hold on. That's not all. <laughs> All right, so I better, better move on here. Uh, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Okay, last one, I promise. I would say instead of us trying to make this argument that somehow Peter was confused and that wasn't really the fulfillment of prophecy, that it was only a foreshadowing and the real last days are going to come, what if the last days were put on hold? What if there was a pause? What if we were gearing up for them? What if, what if the last days were approaching, this whole thing was getting ready to occur, the judgment was about to come, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, all that, and yet God for some reason decided, you know what, hold on, I'm going to implement something different, something outside of the prophetic program, something that's not about Israel in the last days, but rather it's about this thing I'm going to call the body of Christ and a different dispensation, a gospel of which it's not about the law, it's by grace through faith, not of works. This is where rightly dividing the last days is going to be essential. Okay, It's going to be essential for us. When we start to realize that all that stuff in Acts 2 is about Israel prophecy, Israel covenant things, and what we have today is fundamentally different, we will not mess these things up. We will not get confused. We'll not start applying things. And we certainly won't start saying that the apostles were confused and didn't know what they were talking about. Okay? So uh, that's going to be our approach. I think that the best solution is that all of these things were put on hold for a time. And then once our dispensation comes to a close, guess what's going to be spun up? Guess what's going to start? The last days. And when you get to Revelation, what starts to happen? Blood, fire, pillars of smoke, sun turned to darkness, the moon to blood, the great and terrible the day of the Lord approaches. And so uh, we'll get these things right if we rightly divide. And I think that's the key there. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be encouraging today and say quit worrying about tribulation and end times prophecies because we're not in that dispensation, okay? But that doesn't mean that things can't get rough we can absolutely make things pretty rough on ourselves. So let's make good decisions, okay? We'll dig our own holes and create our own problems, but we can also create some solutions as well. All right, do y'all have any questions before I uh, cut out our Sunday school program today? Nothing? Is that it? There's nothing that you'd want me to address? Or that? <laughs> <laughs> that is surprising. Okay, well, let me close out in a word of prayer, and then if you do have a question, then we can ask it if you want to, it not to be on the recording. All right, Lord, thank you so much for this time that we've had to look at your word, and I pray that we just take it for what it says, um, just to take you at your word and understand that what occurred in Acts chapter 2 was prophecy regarding Israel, that kingdom uh, uh, economy, Lord, or uh, dispensation that was made available to them, and yet with the rejection of their Messiah, you decided to put a pause on it and bring in our age of grace. And we're so thankful for it, where we can have great hope and peace and joy uh, in you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay.